Hello everyone, this is your main host, Rudolf Barishish, back again with another episode. And joining me this evening is a very special guest of mine. I'm very glad to have him on, Mr. Lamar Asmo. Lamar, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing great, Rudolf. It's, it's really good to have you on again. And it was a while since I did a show with you. And I, I, I'm always glad and thrilled to have you on. We have a lot to discuss. What I wanted to open up with is that um, the last show that I did, I focused a, uh, a bit on Mr. Andrew Tate's conversion to Islam. And <laughs> as a result of this, we have seen many young rootless men within the West are now starting to gravitate toward Islam. And one of the reasons they are doing this is because that Mr. Tate said, look, I'm fed up with Western degeneracy. I'm fed up with female hypergamy and female promiscuity. So that's why I converted to Islam, because if you convert to Islam, you will have a nice Islamic wife that will take care of the household and that will embrace you as a man and all your male attributes. Now, I wanted to ask you, because you have an insight into that community. I have an insight a little bit, but I, I don't associate with these people that much, albeit I do, I do see them, how the man looks and the woman when I study the couple and so on. And it does, my instinct would be that this is not the case of what I have seen. But I wanted to get your take first on that, because it is truly to deceive the youth, especially the younger male, if they think, look, if you if you become a Muslim, then all your problems will be solved. You will be accepted as a man. You will have a loyal, uh, nice, good looking wife that will take care of the household and that will accept you as a man. What are your thoughts on this? Please go ahead. Uh, I think that's one of the uh, biggest myths that is being perpetuated now. Uh, especially on YouTube, because um, of all the major religions, uh, the Muslims have the most uh, preachers uh, on YouTube proselytizing to, um, you know, non-Asian, uh, uh, particularly in, in the West, you know, and, it, and they, it, they say and do things that they can't get away with in their countries of origin. But it's, it's a really big myth that um, th these Muslim women are going to be, um, you know, ideal um, especially in the West, perhaps in the Persian Gulf, like Saudi Arabia and those countries where Islamic law is strictly enforced. Yes, you can um, yeah. have your, your way, but um, in the West, it doesn't work because the Muslim women in the West have the same shortcomings as Western women. They just, um, and it's actually worse in my view, because at least with um, non-Muslim women, there's no hypocrisy. There's no... Um, Oh, I, I want to dress like a nun, but uh, but you know, beneath the hijab, I'm a hoe. Uh, hence the term hojabi is uh, yeah. is uh, being popularized uh, from uh, Muslim uh, MGTOs, like uh, men going their own way who are Muslims. Uh, there, there's this term hojabi that's um, yeah, it's, it's becoming more yeah. popular. Uh, one yeah, in particular I... uh, showed in Egypt that the, <laughs> the women there are actually doing they're doing scam marriages. One of the religious leaders in uh, Egypt, one of the, the muftis, um, actually made it legal for Muslim women to have temporary uh, husbands there to um, satisfy their sexual urges even. So, yeah, the, the, the Muslim world, it, it's, it's, a, it's one of those, um, it has a good cover story in terms of uh, relationships, but it, it's all the same. Yeah, because my, let's say, view would be that it's very monolithic, monolithic, very closed, and underneath this is just complete depression. To to be honest, that's my view, and yeah. uh, and and I think that it has been sold as a religion that will counter, let's say, Western liberalism and everything that goes along with Western liberalism. For instance, individualism, hyper individualism, and um, and also that people lack, you know, cultural traits or a cultural foundation would be the right word. And however, this is just 
on the surface, but underneath lies something very different, I would say. So I agree here with you too. And also with these Muslim women, even if they are being raised in a strictly Islamic household, uh, it's if they live in the West, they will be one way or the other affected by the current subculture that they live in, one way or another. I don't say that they will maybe, uh, they will not be allowed to do exactly what their Western, uh, let, let's say, friends are doing as well, but they are somehow, they have, they, they view themselves that they, they are acting in a certain way which will only increase more competition among the men, because I don't see this, you know, simply as a quick fix. You're an incel, you live in the West, you follow Mr. Andrew Tate, you see his extravagant lifestyle. Now when he has converted to Islam, oh, immediately it's a quick fix, you become a Muslim and everything will be solved. Not exactly true. Nothing yeah. could be further from the truth. So, uh, and obviously we have a problem in the West because we see, you know, the increase of degeneracy and so on. Now, you and I, we have discussed who are the culprits behind this in certain industries and so on, uh, who are promoting this. It's very controversial to utter that, but obviously there is a huge problem. And now when actually we see more people are um, following, let's say they're becoming, in the West, they're becoming more accepting toward Islam than they were, let's say, 10, 15, 20 years ago. We see it obviously, oh no, we have to understand them. We have to adopt cultural relativism. It's Everything is relative in accordance to their logic and their understanding of, of, of religion and politics in general. And I think this is very dangerous. I, sh I urge that we should actually uh, expose Islam. I think it's good to do so. So don't, so other people don't fall into their trap. What would you say? Uh, yeah, I totally agree because it actually is a trap. Um, you you encounter the same problems, especially living in the West uh, with women, and it, and it's actually worse because um, the hypergamy. One of the uh, chief complaints is is actually um, a, a lot worse. You have and and for example, if Places like um, Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan, where the, the toughest forms of Sharia are enforced, sure. some men could never get married. So they end up actually being homosexuals even. Like, um, yes. you, it, it, it's, it's deep within the culture. Like, um, there's a good documentary for free um, on Amazon about the uh, underbelly of the Persian Gulf. Like, um, one woman actually said, went to a beach in uh, Qatar, and she said, if you come out here at night, and you shine the spotlight, you, you'll see a bunch of gay men just scatter. Like, uh, yeah. yeah, it's... No but, um, no, but it's true. It's true. And if you look at, for instance, a country like Pakistan, they have declared war against, you know, females. For instance, if a couple, especially in the countryside, I would say, but if a couple, you know, if they would have a girl and so on, it's not, they, they would, they have declared it sanctioned by the state that you could easily kill a, a little girl and so on. And imagine how that will affect the ratio among the gender. You will have a majority of men, for instance, like Afghanistan, Pakistan. And imagine, you know, to be honest with you, their sexual drive, and it will probably increase more homosexuality amongst them. So this is also a problem. So I really, and, and furthermore, this is also important. If you want a young, beautiful Muslim girl, and especially who maybe is, uh, who has a low body count or virtually zero body count, let's say this, yeah. imagine the competition within the Muslim community, uh, men that have money, that are rich and so on. Of course, right. they will all gravitate toward that type of girl, whereas the rest of these Muslims will be incels or homosexuals. So I agree, this is a huge, huge problem. It's definitely not a quick fix. And I think it's good that you address that who has an insight into that. Yeah, yeah. And it's, um, I mean, I've seen it from the inside uh, because I grew up under the same, um, well, yeah, especially in my teens, um, I was under the same uh, illusion. Like from the outside looking in, it's like, oh, these women are, um, they're godly. They're not like out here like the uh, other women trying to, um, I guess, you know, entice men with their bodies and uh, be promiscuous when 
you know, it's it's actually the exact same thing for them, um, except for since they do have these restrictions, they have to be even more secretive about it. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot, especially in the, the the black American community, there was actually an imam that gave a sermon about it. He was like um, talking about how uh, the women, he was like, you're supposed to be saving your body for your husband, but a lot of you lost your virginity to a non-Muslim man. And it's like, when you do get married, you don't uh, fulfill your obligations. So yeah, it's um, it, it looks good from the outside looking in, but it's it's not a solution. Um, the the same uh, uh, feminism has has infected uh, Muslim women as well. Again, to the point where uh, in in Egypt, you know, the, there was actually a video that uh, I'm not gonna mention his name, but a, an Egyptian YouTuber shared a video of an Egyptian woman telling um, Egyptian women to do scam marriages, basically when they marry their first husband stay married for this amount of time so they can get this amount of benefits after the divorce. And then, you know, and then he of also course. said another thing they're doing too is uh, living on their own and uh, pretty much, um, you know, prostituting themselves. Um, you know, they get their own apartment and then they get married. Once they're tired of that, you know, that, that lifestyle, then they go to the mosque to get married. Uh, in America, another thing that happens too is that, okay, you convert to Islam and they'll have a, a woman ready for you to marry, but she already has uh, two kids, you know? So it's, it's no, um, there's no silver bullet to uh, the way that of course. the uh, new it's world no... order um, ruined women. Exactly. <laughs> I think, I think, to be honest with you, uh, my analysis would be, and I don't want to offend anyone and so on, but they are mostly useful idiots, you know, because they will just create because they want to advance their own interest on European soil. And the only reason they're allowed to do so is that there are certain lobby groups. For instance, the Cubanos, Americanos, they're letting them expand, uh, you know, in our yeah. territory. So, and and this is, of course, only to create more, you know, uh, just to create more divisions amongst us. And the interesting thing is, I just don't see, if, if we follow this man, Andrew Tate, when he now converted to Islam, he say, okay, everything is a quick fix, everything will be fine now. However, Mr. Tate, he has not exposed the true, you know, in the in institutions and individuals involved in shaping world politics. I have not noticed that, you know. Yeah, and that's correct, yeah. And, 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 and for uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go on. No, 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 no. Go ahead. And I wanted to transition over. Now we have seen it has been a little bit of a circus in the U.S. media now. After Mr. Ye, Kanye West, he has uttered certain statements on the Alex Jones show. Now, I am pretty torn towards Mr. Kanye. I think he is not mentally stable. I mean, he 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 yeah. says certain stuff that are not that reasonable. I mean, for instance, I wouldn't be surprised if he would say, oh, there are certain stuff with Jim Crow that is good too. You know, I'm, I'm just mm -hmm. being honest, the way I see it. And then he said, oh, there are certain, I don't want to mention this uh, political uh, leader's name, but he said, uh, uh, age. And he said, oh, there are certain stuff that are good with him too, and so on. And so, so he said certain stuff. And then on the other hand, he also exposes uh, certain lobby groups and how they have stranglehold on certain musicians and artists and so on. And I think that it, at least what my conclusions will be on this is that it gives you, uh, let's say, uh, it gives you an indication of who is running the show because we see the consequences with it. Oh, I was meaning to ask you, what are your thoughts on Mr. Ye and his latest statements? Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I, I was going to say, um, I, I mostly... I, I view it, um, uh, it, it, it's mixed for me because I like the fact that he shifted the, um, what's known as the Overton window um, <laughs> and and actually put out uh, something that's been true for centuries. And it, it's a shame that we just keep uh, going in this, this circle because it's obvious that um, some of the things he's saying is, is actually true. And I think, um, but most people will view him as insane. Like you said, he is um, uh, mentally <laughs> unstable. But um, a lot of the things that he brings up is actually true. But he even gets back. 
he he gives bad examples or no examples. So for instance, he'll say like, oh, um, the um, the J people control the um, they control the the uh, music industry, but instead of elaborating on how and 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 how why uh, they control the industry he'll he'll bring up something uh, he won't even finish his point and he'll say well chris paul slept with my wife it's like dude stick to the topic like um you know like he'll he'll mention something or they control the uh, economy they control finance and then he'll say well um, you know my, my my wife was caught in bed with this nba player it's like Come on, yeah. man, you, you have to, to finish the point, but he never does. But I, I can say the only positive thing is he did bring that uh, issue into the limelight um, of um, the, the Israeli power in our societies. It's like you mentioned with them um, implementing their, their strategy of importing uh, Muslims into Europe. I mean, well, that's actually course. so many of their officials and their religious leaders have said that there's a video where a rabbi because they believe in this thing called Noahide laws, and um, sure. that this is why they encourage um, Arab uh, immigration in, into uh, Europe, especially not just Arab but um, Islamic uh, migrants, because those um, Islamic migrants follow Noahide laws. Um, it's yes, that, and that, that's part of it. And, and for everyone that is skeptical of this, because I remember when I had a discussion with Mr. Jeff Nyquist on this particular topic, I gave him, I even named up two organizations that are working to actually bring in more Muslim migrants into the West. One is Israel and the other one is Hias, which is a constellation of certain rabbis. I think it's NY based. And they want to welcome the stranger. And with the stranger, they're particularly talking about their Islamic kin, you know. And I also had a discussion with another Jewish gentleman. Uh, he was very polite and so on. But he said, you know what? We share certain cultural traits with Muslims. And yeah. uh, so we are very close to them. And I believe that that is actually the case. I don't see... And a, a big antagonism between them. Sure, you can say that there are certain Islamists that are very skeptical and critical, uh, let's say, of Zionism in general and so on. But, but they would never dig deep into uh, the JQ. Rather, they would say it's the big bad Satan, United States, UK, and you know Christianity in general that are going against them. What would you say about that? Uh, I would say that's true. Uh, and, and the sad part is the only the only um, segment, and they, they only do it to a limited degree, that mentions uh, the JQ are the, um, the re what they call the resistance axis, like um, uh, Hezbollah, the Iranian government, the Syrians, people who have directly been impacted by um, the Cubanos, Americanos in, in a very negative way. They're the only ones who, who are slightly above the target, but even they pull the punch. But they pull punches. Even and yeah. and and throughout oh. Islamic history, there's been a lot of examples of philo semitism. Uh, part of the reason, and and this is just a legend, but um, that area known as Khazaria, um, you know, part of the reason that they converted to uh, Judaism, if if the legend is true, is because when they asked the Arab Muslim um, which faith they should choose, if they don't choose their faith. They suggested Judaism over Christianity, so and vice yeah. and vice versa. Um, unfortunately, uh, it, it's like you, you run into these um, philo Semitic um, helpers uh, over the centuries. When you look into the past, they're they've been moving around uh, not only in uh, Christian Europe but also in the Islamic world and um, acquiring power. And, and it's like you said, they're close cousins. If if, if the Bible. One of the things that I do still believe in the Old Testament of the Bible is that um, uh, the Israelis are uh, our cousins. The, the, the Ishmaelites and the Israelites are cousins, and and, and that's how that's how I view them. They're they're both uh, Semitic supremacists. They just have different ways of going about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and you know you mentioned Hezbollah and Iran, uh, but I also heard statements. Let's say. If you look, if you back the tape and look at the statements on Ayatollah Khomeini, they they would always put more emphasis on the great Satan, United States, 
it's lately yes. when uh, Ahmadinejad was in power that he had a, congr a conference on anti-Zionism in 2006, something like that, I believe. But that was, you know, that's not the entire, it's not dominating the public discourse in Iran either. You can find right. many Iranians who are very hateful against Westerners and so on. I just wanted to bring that up because I think it's important too. And I think it's very, I think for people who are critical of, let's say, a certain lobby group and their way of uh, influencing our lives, if I put it this way, I think right. be very careful when you are dealing with people from Iran and other of these countries too, because I have noticed it's quite, because when these people come over to the West, for instance, they often ally themselves with anti-racist groups, for instance, they also are in favor of bringing in more migrants into the West, and they are also critical of the state of Israel in terms of its Zionist composition, but not of who, let's say, who are actually supporting the creation of the state. Right, and right, the underlying um, ideology exactly. behind it, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I would also say a particular ethnicity who is dominant in that sense. I think that is often le left out when you have a conversation with them. So I yeah. think is is and and I think this should we should take this into consideration too. And I have always wondered why for instance a tiny state um how is it possible if if there is such a antagonism between Islam and we see a clash of civilization between Islam and Judaism, for instance. How come they have not con conducted in recent years a frontal attack against the state of Israel altogether? Why so? Okay, people would say, oh, they're divided. You have the Shiites, you have the Sunnis, and stuff like that. I understand that. But in general, I have not seen a collective effort to just bring down the state of Israel in recent years. What would you say? Uh, I would agree, and, and and the sad part is you won't see that because they've yeah. essentially they've they've sold out the the government, especially the governments in the region. Like uh, ever since uh, Anwar Sadat in Egypt, Egypt used to be the primary uh, fighter for the Arabs, and once um, you had the Camp David meetings, and uh, Anwar yes. Sadat sold out to um, to He's the right. um, Zionists. Yeah, it's 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 been a downhill uh, downward spiral, and apparently Saudi Arabia was the first country to sell out uh, under the table a long time ago. Yes. Very long, because of all those Arab wars that you mentioned. Like you said, they used to fight as a united front against Israel. Saudi Arabia stopped participating right after the first uh, defeat of the Arabs. And, and, and their participation in that first war against Israel, they just sent a few, uh, you know, few hundred camel jockeys to go up against a modern, a modern army. And um, yeah. it, it, it's unfortunate for the Arabs, but their governments have sold them out. But um, it, it, they've, they've really softened up against um, the, the Israelis. And um, I saw in Qatar, though, um, the, the people, they're doing the World Cup there, and the people won't respond to Israeli uh, media, the uh, natives. Will. So they're yeah. still in antagonism with the um, average uh, Arab in, in the street. But the uh, Arab governments have definitely sold out. The uh, only government that was against uh, Israel in that region uh, and, and still is, but it can't really do anything, especially now, is Syria. Syria never signed um, a peace deal with Israel, and they allowed... No, but it's, 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 because of, it, it's because of territorial... It's because of the Golan, Golani Heights that Israel right. took in 1967. Right. But I... I, I would say to you that like this, my friend, this is my, and I want to have a co conversation with people about this. Let's assume that Israel will give back Gol Golan Heights. Let's even say if they would give back the other territories that they took from 1967. And, and, let, and, and perhaps the refugee question is also, it is, if, let's say they will bring people back and so on. I just don't see, I, first of all, I just don't see this being realized. That's just being honest. 
But then I believe that it would actually, I'm certain that it would shift over to how things were before the Zionists started colonializing, uh, let's say, uh, Palestinian land. What would you say? Because I have not seen so much antagonism, to be honest, prior, let's say, to the Zionist colonization about this. I think that they would work pretty well together. I think, for instance, uh, people belonging to the certain lobby group, they often mention they, they have more resentment against European patriotism and European culture than they have toward Islam. Oh, uh, I, 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 just... I totally agree. From, from my reading of history, uh, yes, they, they enjoyed um, great success, yeah. especially in uh, the Ottoman Empire, just like how they did with some uh, European uh, nation states. They uh, infiltrated the financial sector and they essentially controlled the economy of, of the Ottoman Empire. And the same thing is happening today. You know, these um, these uh, Abraham agreements, all it's going to do is usher in, um, you know, Israeli control of those countries that, um, or at least of their economy. And, and the, the Saudi Arabians were, were so foolish as to allow this, um, this software known as Pegasus into their telecommunications. So the, the Israelis, I'm pretty sure the Israelis have every... The same way the United States gathers uh, through the NSA, they gather everything that goes over um, electronic communications. The Israelis have uh, dirt on uh, all, uh, at every level, they have dirt on the Saudi society. So uh, even if Saudi Arabia wanted to do an about face and uh, fight Israel, it would be impossible. I'm pretty sure they have so much information about not only their, their military, but their economy and their, their even the private sector. So uh, Israel totally controls that region, uh, especially the governments. Maybe some of the people don't like them. And, and, they, and yes, they will, they will enjoy great success. Um, I think we'll see that in the coming decades. If, if the trends continue, you're going to have a situation where um, it's, it's pretty normal between um, the Arabs in that region, um, you know, especially places like Jordan and Egypt. Uh, it, it, it's... I mean, Israelis travel yeah. uh, freely uh, throughout yeah, I, the region I, now. I was I was actually about to 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 mention Jordan, like you said. Yeah, they do travel freely there, and it's like actually no big issue and so on. I, yeah, I really agree with you here, and I think I wanted to ask you, I wanted to get your take because the consequences of what Kanye has said and so on. Because I want to also look at how it will f affect public speech um, in, in, in the United uh, yeah. States. Yeah, and, and this is a very important topic. Uh, he said this on his show. This has become a circus in my view, obviously. You know, I heard that he is running for president. He is associating with this guy, Nick Fuentes, who is very bizarre young man, I would yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. And, He's a, and also, yeah. the, and he had this Milo Yiannopoulos, this homosexual Greek, not Greek, pseudo Greek, uh, Cubano. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I was going to say and he, he admitted to being a tribesman once. Yeah, and, and what happened? I think he kicked out Yiannopoulos and his associating with Nick Fuentes. So this is actually a circus. Now, please tell me, what do you think will be the consequences of this? Uh, yes, it, it, it definitely was a circus. And um, also, um, uh, Nick Fuentes, there's um, evidence that he also may be um, uh, homosexual as well. I, th uh, he's, I he's, think uh, so, done too. In, he's I done and said he got caught like Alex Jones uh, watching uh, tranny porn in, a, <laughs> in uh, one of his... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> who, who who got caught? I think it did, uh, wasn't uh, the Jones. It was uh, it was uh, Fuentes. There's actually a funny <laughs> there, there's actually a funny documentary um about him called um the by the cum detective. They call it the cum de because they said basically um he took some very <laughs> creepy creepy pictures of one of his friends while he was sleeping, and then they said he went over his room uh, with a blue light looking for um, semen stains. You know, this oh guy's really, God. like you said, he's very bizarre. Oh, no, also, I don't like him. I can see, yeah. you know, it's not he, always, you shouldn't judge a person by the person's looks. But some sometimes, 
a person look can actually prove his correct character. And when yeah. I see him, he looks very, you know, strange. I would say Nick Fuentes, and uh, he well, has also said some crazy stuff too. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, uh, the strange look uh, apparently. His grandfather was uh, Mexican, hence his uh, surname, yeah. Fuentes. So maybe yeah. that's a part of that. Um, you know, and uh, I guess the rest of his ancestry was white, but he has the, the Mexican grandfather. And, um, yeah, he's supposed to be a traditional Catholic, but he does a lot of uh, untraditional things. Like, there's, they say he has this thing called a cat boy fetish, where this, uh, this, this uh, apparently this Australian uh, homosexual he was hanging with put on these cat ears and he was talking about uh, how he wanted to have sex with them. This guy, all these guys, it, it's a psyop. Um, you know, yes. these guys are a part of a psyop. It, it's basically to muddy the waters and to make people who talk about the truth look crazy. Just like Alex Jones. Yes. Like, they're, they're here to make exactly. Truth. Yeah, yeah, they're here not to make a, truth but not look a, crazy. You know, be, yeah, exactly. And you know what is so frightening? is that this is a golden opportunity for the elite just to put them in a box called conspiracy theorists. Oh, you know, do you really think that those people are running the show? Oh my God, you must be a conspiracy theorist, just like Mr. Ye. You must be complete crazy, even if you give the most rational arguments for your case. Yeah, and, and, and it's insane. Um, and, and apparently uh, he's also a Nazbull. Uh, he follows the doctrines of uh, Mr. Dugan. But no, you're, you're, yes. you're, you're absolutely right. Um, it, it's, it's, it's really sad. Like, they, they use, they're using Kanye right now, like you said, to stifle. They're actually going to eventually use it to stifle free speech. Like, right now in the United States, it's still legal to do research uh, questioning the Holocaust. But eventually yeah. what I think is going to happen is um, under the banner of hate speech, um, uh, the First Amendment is what saves us. But you already can't really practice the First Amendment because if you do and say certain things, even me, I could actually, even though it's a part of my contract with my job, we're supposed to have um, freedom of speech and freedom of political thought and association. But if I were to say certain things, if enough people from my job say, Due to his views, we don't want to work with him. I could be fired. So it's, imagine, um, yeah, that's it, so it, horrible. Yeah, it, it has reached those certain levels, and you know, like you and I, we both have children, and we want to, you know, think what will happen, you know, in the long run for us, and how will our people, you know, see this? Because obviously, this is a huge problem. You and I do connect on. On many levels here, we obviously, we, we do understand who is actually running the show and what their right. motives are, you know, but many people, they don't know that. And they, then they don't now, know. And then they think people like, uh, they think the Russians are the solution. But um, yes. what I would like, what I would like for you to do, they, they don't know the names like you, you coming from a Slavic background, you actually know the languages. You can look at many sources. So you you know names that I've never heard of, like this this Friedman gen, uh, uh, gentleman from Russia, this tribeman who, who's actually Mikhail Friedman, yes. Yeah, Friedman. yeah. So please, um, for the audience members who may listen to us who who are not familiar with um the Israeli element in Eastern Europe, can you just of, give us a course, brief of rundown of the names and and what they of actually course, do? Of course, of course. Well, yes, of course. Well, I think if, if if you really want to understand, let's say, how contemporary Russia is shaped by certain families from the Soviet era, you have to go back in time when the Soviet Union was consolidated. And I'm talking about after 1921. From, from 1970 to 1921, they had a revolution. And from 1921, you had the Politburo. So if you, if you, you have to study their names and you will qu quickly find that there is an overrepresentation of people belonging to, to a certain ethnicity. And right. these people are the ones who have a, a, let's say, stranglehold on contemporary Russia too, today. They have, they, they are, let's say, they belong to the upper echelons of the Russian political power and they are the ones of, uh, the oligarchs. So if you study the oligarchs, you will quickly notice that uh, the majority of them actually do have dual citizenship. 
and they have uh, Russian citizenship and they are also uh, Israeli citizens. This is no secret. M Michael Friedman is, is, is one of them. And then you have many more. And I will, I, I, I think I did a video, it was, uh, I think it was two years ago, or something on like that when I name dropped some of them, but I could mm -hmm. have gone much harder on this too. And um, yes, I, I, I'm more than willing to, to, if you look at also, there are certain within Putin's inner circle, it's called the Siloviki, it's his inner circle. And within oh. that, you will also find certain uh, elements that are uh, of, of, of that origin and so on. So, wow, yeah. wow. And so I, um, would, I would say primarily look at the oligarchs that are in the country and not only those that are out of the country. Those that are out of the country may have pissed off Putin because th the thing is like this, Putin rose to power in August of 1999. He was handpicked by Boris Yeltsin. So it was no election that they took an outside guy and just gave him power. He was handpicked by Boris Yeltsin, who at that time was totally controlled by these certain elements. And, and it is also a fact that Putin, he went against one fraction of the oligarchy but he also had to ally himself with others in order to, to survive. Otherwise, he would, be, would have been wiped out as well. And I believe if you want to get to the root cause of, of how this happened, you have to study the revolution from 1970 to 1921 and the Politburo from 1921 and onwards to see who were overrepresented in the Soviet society. And then wow, you will have excellent. Excellent. And I so, wanted to, um, I wanted one, to do one, that. One, one quick question: Can Putin do anything about these oligarchs? Because my thing is, if he if he was an independent man and a um, pro-Russian, uh, white Russian, uh, Slavic um, nationalist, could he actually get rid of these um, uh, 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 Cuban Americans, or is he um, beholden to them totally? Like, how much? Um, power does he actually have or is it the likes of Mr. Friedman uh, who actually uh, runs the show or people like Mr. Friedman? I think it's like this, you know, in the Russian society, I, I am most certain that they did not undergo that revolution that were portrayed in the West. Like when you have Glasnost, you had the Perestroika, and then all of a sudden, the disintegration of the Soviet Union, it presented a new Russia, the birth, or let's say the rebirth of the Russian Federation. Now, those families that belong to the nomenclatura previously, they just took on new roles, for instance, in business, in other parts of the society, and they just never, Russia was never really emancipated. Oh, okay. Like many people thought. I think it just continued, but in a different, let's say it morphed into a different, uh, so uh, a I, different I so, so, so the same people got into a different uh, vehicle. <laughs> they... Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, 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 and there you have it, for instance, you met, like Mikhail Friedman, very powerful within the sphere of finance. And, and there are other, you know, as well in, in that right. in, in other you know what really too. disappointed me the chief rabbi of, of Russia of the Russian Federation actually said no it's, it's cool to be Jewish in Russia now he's like it's a trend and I'm like oh my god <laughs> you know it's a, oh man yeah I actually, and, and, and the, yeah he yeah, said there's uh, no anti-semitism there, there's no anti-semitism in Russia and and, and what's interested is that if if you follow, for instance, uh, if you follow the Chabad Lubavitch, this conservative, uh, this very conservative movement, uh, and it's, it's it's very anti-Gentile, I would say. And for instance, how is that how is that possible that they are able to prosper in a society? that in the West is described as highly anti-Semitic, and especially having ties with, with Vladimir Putin himself. It, it doesn't make no sense. What would you say? Right. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, which, um, 
it, it kind of um it makes me feel down about our circumstances. But uh, talking to Charles Giuliani last week, he made me feel better by saying pe- people like us, we we've actually won. We defeated them as as individuals. They can't control us. They can't control our thoughts. But they do have the power over both sides of of major governments, of of the media on both sides. It's it's totally absurd. But it's it. From, from what you just said, like they also control Russia. So Russia is supposed to be the adversary of the European Union and the United States. Th- that means they control, you know, uh, the most powerful uh, g- global powers. And the only outlier would be China. But I'm pretty sure they they probably control China as well. <laughs> it's, uh, you know. But that's or, quite. Yeah, what, what, it's. It's quite interesting how they, uh, with the Chinese, how we're going to see it. it is, uh, uh, but if we look at it, with China, is a little bit different. But I would say with Russia, you see, I would say, just look at all of these oligarchs that receive dual citizenship and that are traveling back and forth from, let's say, Moscow to Tel Aviv and so on. And also look at the ties, for instance, I did a video on this and I did a dis- I had a discussion with uh, with Mr. Nyquist on this topic too. We studied the uh, overrepresentation of these political commissars during the Soviet Union, even during the reign of Stalin, you know. And also that uh, they have many monuments in Israel for the Red Army and so on. So, so I, I say that they always had a shared, uh, let's say, they have a shared connection, and we should never forget it was not the United States who 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 um, declared Israel as a as a sovereign yeah. nation. It was actually yeah, it was the, the Soviet, Soviet Union, under, Mr. Yeah, Stalin, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Stalin. And this and and what is interesting too, Stalin was married to uh, Lazar Kaganovich's sister, so Lazar Kaganovich was uh, uh, Stalin's right man, uh, he was also of that descent, you know, and he was involved, he, he was one of the chief art- architects involved in the famine crisis of, of Holodomor from 1932 to 1933, for instance. So you have these connections, so I urge people to go back and study these historical documents, and I actually wanted to do a show, it was supposed to be the last show or uh, discussion with Nyquist, and uh, I wanted to go back from 1921 and study all of the names and so on and give him, you know, and have a discussion on this. And he said, are you willing to, to do so? And he said, oh, you know, but there is a chance that the video might get banned due to that and so on. So just, and then I have not heard from him. Yeah, that. yeah. He but said, I really want to. Yeah, he wants to be mainstream. And uh, when you're main, yeah, you can't talk about the things we talk about and uh, be accepted into the mainstream. You can't even entertain and which is the, the the sad part? They control the the dialogue on any major platform, and uh, people like us yes. get shadow banned, and um, w- w- which is why, like, uh, I think it, it's good. I wish people would migrate over to like Odyssey and uh, these other bit shoot these other platforms yes. because you don't get suppressed in the algorithm uh, with uh, the truth on these smaller platforms. Maybe that'll change if they were to get bigger and corporate, but. Maybe the word would get out more, but yeah, they that's that's part of the the main powers control over the media and suppressing information, which sure. you know that's the one positive thing about what Kanye did was he actually even mentioning it may prompt some people into doing an investigation, and all they would have to do um and he actually had a list when he talked talked about media control. He did name some corporation, so I will give uh, Mr. Ye. I like to call him Ye because that's how he spelled it. I like to give uh, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Ye. Yeah, I, li- I like to give him some credit for that. You know, of course, he 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 named corporations like Disney, and they have a stranglehold, and they're also promoting this um, the LGBTQI. Uh, uh, they actually added I to it now. They they're promoting this agenda. And uh, but I think Disney is starting to feel the backlash from that, and they're going to calm down a bit because uh, apparently they lost yeah. a lot of money on these uh, Marvel, these comic book movies, 
have not been making as much money as they used to. But he has done. He has, he, Mr. Yeah, he has done quite good stuff. He exposed, for instance, this Spanish luxury fashion brand Balenciaga, who did a disgusting, tasteless commercial with chill, depicting oh, yeah. children as objects, which is totally gross. I think. I think. And and what is even more shocking is that his ex-wife uh, still have not, you know, taken a distance about, from Balenciaga. Yeah. yeah. Right, uh, right. You know, and it's 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 horrible, you know. So I think he 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 has done certain stuff that I really like, you know. Yeah. And uh, it, it kudos to him for for having the balls to do so because it's very tough. I think right. we had one who tried was Mel Gibson, but. He caved in afterwards, so I don't like men that much when he did the fashion. I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't blame uh, people like Mel or because um, Henry Ford also caved. You know, these yeah, people... they caved in. Marlon Brando caved in. He started yeah. crying and said, "I grew up with rat with Jews." <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I like, think... it, it, and and um, Nick Cannon. We have this um uh, gentleman, Nick Cannon. He's um. A part of my group too. Um, he has this show, uh, Wilding Out. He also caved. Like he he went at them and um, he did an apology tour. He did a bunch of shows with rabbis, getting educated. You know. <laughs> and I think I think I think when you if you are a man of, of, of for instance that statue that have, let's say some kind of authority, and you're able to criticize and so on, and all of a sudden you just you know start apologizing, you know, oh, I'm sorry for, I, I, I think it will only get worse. I right, think you right. need to be much more resolute and yeah, just focus Especially on... in the case of Mel, you know, because Mel Gibson, remember, he was worth half a billion dollars in the early 2000s before he, you know, before he uh, came out against them. But they immediately, like, they got his wife to divorce him and gave her a ridiculous, like, $400 million uh, award in the in divorce And I think they will do that. And I think they will do the exactly same with Ye, because I heard that Kim will, it, it will be a very costly yeah, divorce. Yeah, he yeah. has to pay her $2 million a, a month, and yeah, eventually he's lost his most lucrative deals already. So yeah, eventually yes. he's going to end up, uh, yeah, he's going to end up in bankruptcy, I think, because yeah, with this, this onerous uh, child support he has to pay, even though she's oh a billionaire. God. Yeah, my Imagine. thing is... Uh, yeah, she, she's supposed to be worth a billion dollars as well. So why does he have to pay that absorbent child support, given the fact that she's also a billionaire? Uh, it's it's absurd. But they, Oh, he's not he, a billionaire anymore. I think nope. I think when Balenciaga and Adidas deal were cut off, I think he immediately, his net worth yeah, yeah, four, was from $1 to billion 400. to 400 million. Yeah, yeah. But see, you know, Kim, it, it, Kim, Kim is also a billionaire. That's what I'm saying. Kim, Kim yeah. Kardashian is also a billionaire as well. What kind of ethnicity is that, my friend, Kardashian? What, no, what well, is they, 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 they claim she's Armenian, but, um, I mean, with her activities and her family's activities, I wouldn't be surprised if they weren't crypto. No. Yeah. You know what I thought of? What's yeah, that? No, the same. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I thought like you. It must be some kind of... Uh, let's say, tribes element into that family. I mean, it, I wouldn't be surprised. Right. I wouldn't be, uh, probably the husband, maybe the one that was uh, OJ's lawyer. And apparently, like, OJ is supposed to be the father of um, one of them as well. So, yeah, when you do stuff like that, yeah, it really opens you up to being, it's just like the, you, you mentioned Balenciaga. I'm pretty sure the, the pro, um, the pro pedo, uh, ad, ad, advertisers, I'm pretty sure they were probably, when, when you peel back the curtain on the occult, what you find is a lot of these occult people are also uh, uh, crypto tribesmen or tribesmen, yeah. like this Marina yeah, Abramovich. I, I, she has a very tribal look, and she's a practitioner of Thelema, and uh, Thelema is the religion invented by uh, Aleister Crowley. Yeah, also, she's, she's uh, yeah. Yeah. Serb, you go Serbian, but I don't think that that is one a true Serb. Yeah, yeah, I, I was gonna say she doesn't really uh, look uh, too Serbian. <laughs> yeah, no, um, no, that's oh, that's true. That's true. 
and uh, yeah, it, it's 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 really it's really sad. Like uh, they they um the only only religions that they don't have a toehold in are some of these uh, neo pagan movements for obvious reasons. Uh, but other other than that, they, they I mean um I, I didn't know uh, they infiltrated the Catholic Church yeah. and and the Vatican too was it, it, it's it's a shame they they've taken over um all all the major religions they have agents. And then these synagogues, when you read a book, there's a book. Yeah, by, and, 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 um, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. I think it will kind of consequences we will have from all of this. Right, right. Uh, it's we, we we talked about Iran earlier, and I, I'm in total agreement with you that they, uh, even though they, they appear to be, um, it's like you said, they they, they blame the West more. They blame the U.S. and England, and um, they have a lot of um, yeah. It's it's always this, it, 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 yes. It's always this like, for instance, this this foreign policy discourse that usually left the stakes. It, it's usually oil. It's, right. It, it's the oil incentive. Right. It's U.S. imperialism. Imperialism. Yeah. Right. And and it, it's it's ridiculous because we know who controls this um, imperialism and who controls this uh, global economy, and who benefits from it. And and if the Iranians were serious, exactly. they would do something. Because um, when I read the book, there's a book of uh, several books about the Mossad, and they have these different um, non-Israeli helpers. Some are called Sayanim. They have cats. Yeah. And what you find out is that synagogues are actually miniature uh, embassies. You know, it, 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 that's how they function. They're, they're intelligence assets for that community. And, um, yeah, it's, it's bad news when you have those in your country. But, unfortunately, uh, due, due to freedom of religion, it, there's just no way of um, uprooting these people, seemingly. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But I wanted to ask you another uh, uh, issue, too, now. Um, how do you see this, you know, this conflict continuing now between the Russia, you mentioned a little bit to me prior to this that you had another, you you participated on, on another host show and so on, and he said that it's, it's a conflict that is a little bit like as a show for the, yeah. the masses and so on. But what are your thoughts now? We see this crisis, uh, war, it has not stopped, it will continue, now it's winter time. Uh, Russia obviously lost a hell of a lot of troops and so on. We see the Ukrainians continue fierce fighting. Any 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 thoughts on this? I see this as a, just uh, a tragic uh, yeah, outcome. I, was gonna I say, want this um, conflict to be shut down immediately. Yeah, right. go ahead. Yeah, um, I, it, it's just like Germany uh, in World War Two. Uh, there, there, the Ukrainian people are going to bear the brunt of the suffering and the deaths. Like a lot of them are, are gonna are gonna pay for this. Um, it's just, it, I look at it as a charade. Now I used to be on the fence. Like I used to actually think that um, you know, Russia was a competitor, but I'm starting to lean on the um. Uh, there was a conspiracy, a theorist named Alan Watt who died, and his whole thing was um that both sides are controlled by the same uh, people, and it it is it, it, what it looks like to me. Like for example. Um, it was been leaked. Uh, a Angela Merkel actually said that had they not done the Minsk agreement, Russia could have um, taken over you know, Ukraine easily prior to that. So I'm pretty sure Russian intelligence knew that. So why didn't they go about it that way? Uh, why did they wait? It, it, it's, to me, it looks a lot like what happened in Syria. Russia could have resolved that conflict in a much better state for the Syrian government if the Syrian government was their ally. But instead, they did all these um, pauses, these humanitarian pauses, and these negotiations that led nowhere. And what it allowed to happen was the United States to gain a presence. And and I think the same is going to happen to you to, to Ukraine. I think the Russians are going to probably take the entire uh, Black Sea coast. I still think they're going to do that. And um, Ukraine is going to be left with a rump state, and they're going to be heavily dependent, and they're going to be heavily exploited by. Uh, Europe and uh, the United States financially, like they they won't really have an economy. This is going to be used as an opportunity 
to um, make Ukraine like the Africa of Europe. They're going to use it for resources and whatever else they well, can. Of course, um, with the grain production of grain. And right. The and and, and they're match. going to just, yeah. yeah, they're destroying the people. It's, it's really awful. It's really awful. I, I mean, Russia's lost a lot, but I don't think they're going to lose um, the war ultimately. I think they're going to achieve their objectives because if you look at what Putin said before the war, he claimed that uh, they were doing it to demilitarize Ukraine. And and unless oh, the de, West can denazify de it too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, denazify. And now now the, now the latest stage is de satanize it. <laughs> right, right. So I think um those objectives are gonna be achieved because what's gonna happen with the Azov uh, battalion and groups like that, they're gonna be thrown under the bus. Once negotiations do start, they're gonna end up in the hay. The, the 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 Western media is going to change the narrative. They're going to have um they're going to say, oh, we have these pro democratic Ukrainian forces. They were the good guys, yes. but the the actual Azov, they're going to be scapegoated. Watch, that's what I think. Just the, the same way they do with um Sunni terrorists, they're going to do to the uh, the Azov. Like they they're the best fighters for Ukraine, but once the negotiations start and the war finally does end, they're going to be blamed for what whatever war crimes from the Ukrainian side. They're going to be blamed for it. Mr. Zelensky is going to end up in London or or, um, or um, Jerusalem or even even in New York. Even, you know, he's going to be OK, him and his uh, inner circle. But the Ukrainian people are going to pay. And, it, and it's sad because I don't think Russia will back down without a positive result. I mean, who knows whether they'll take the border area with Belarus. I think that's also a possibility. But um, th this war was a disaster. Of course, it, it, it was totally preventable, and um, it, it, it looks more like a theater. Um, it, it's like the WWF. You know, these these uh, leaders pretend that they're enemies on the surface, but the people behind the scenes control both sides. So there, there's really it's, it's it's all up to them what happens in these uh, peace agreements. Mm -hmm. No, I think you summarize it quite good. I uh, uh, I think the best solution. I think that this is actually a vestige conflict. I think it should have been solved because we have over an animosity over 150 years between the Ukrainians and the Russians, and this has been you know um, very much written within you know certain communist circles. I believe even Friedrich Engels wrote a piece that was very derogatory against the the Slavic people and so on. So the communists always wanted the Slavic people to wipe out each other. Um, right. So, so I'm, qu I'm quite certain of that too. And I think that this conflict should have been resolved. I think uh, one watershed in politics, I don't know if you noticed, is that the German um, parliament voted uh, to recognize the Holodomor, uh, the famine crisis that was initiated by the Soviets from 1932 to 1933 as genocide. And I think it, it, it's good because it has often been, you know, how to say, uh, rejected by the Soviets. That it was never... Right. it was downplayed, like, um, yeah. And exactly. And, and I think it's very important that we should highlight. Uh, for instance, I believe, and this is my statement, I believe How many that people died in the Holodomor? Uh, six million, uh, uh, between three to six million people in during the course of one year famine crisis. I mean, it even resulted to cannibalism. So it's unbelievable. And and I think uh, I think this is something that should be often discussed, and it has been so often rejected by the Soviets that oh no, it was never like that and so on. But uh, so obviously you have. Uh, let's say, an animosity between the Ukrainians and the Russians that should have been resolved, especially when it comes to the territories, because we have that we had that issue too uh, when we fought a war against the Serbs, for instance. Right. And uh, now we managed to emerge victorious. And at that time, the Soviet Union was, was sorry, Russia was very weak. It was in a decay. So they could not support their Serbian brothers uh, to that extent that they really wanted to. And somehow we, we hold the line. We fought very well, Croats. And then afterwards, we allied with the West and so on. And we managed to, to get 
all of our territories back. Now, nothing, I would be very happy if the Ukrainian could achieve the same goal. However, Russia is a different animal. I truly understand that. So, but I think they should have resolved this peacefully and just not have this, that type of conflict in a current age when we Europeans open up our countries for non-European, for massive non-European migration. And this will have a profound effect on all of Europe. So the timing right. was not the best. And the same uh, power, the same people. I was people... going to say maybe that's a positive outcome because uh, perhaps a lot of the Ukrainians will. So, so, so instead of getting as many immigrants from uh, Asia and Africa, maybe the Ukrainians will go um, to Western Europe. And you know, help with the native population, perhaps. I don't. Yeah, I don't but we have, you know, but that's that's a very, you know, good good um, conclusion that you that you brought. But but we still see people coming from, you know, non-European countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, you no, know, and oh, and no. I have and, and and everyone talks about oh, we have so many Ukrainians. Actually, I have not seen so many Ukrainians here. I still see non-European people coming over constantly. So, and Sweden is in a not in a in a not good condition, I would say. So, and and the same goes for 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 other Western European countries. I don't understand why, given because the Swedes are intelligent people, why don't they realize that um, their ethnicity is being undermined and increase their numbers, like despite whatever hardships, like. Why aren't the uh, Swedes like forming, you know, states within the state, basically, you know, like um, uh, ditto for the Norwegians. Like, you know, why can't they yeah. just um, have more kids? Like, why, why is there no uh, incentive on that? Like, I, I think would... they're very I think if, if you study Sweden, people are very indoctrinated. You have the legacy from the social democrats that always preach social uh, multiculturalism from 1976 and onwards oh, no. you know <laughs> and also egalitarianism in general now mixed with multiracialism and people are very indoctrinated oh you know i don't want to be a racist and so on they're very decent people in sweden i urge you to come and visit me and i will show you around you know so you get the chance to see it would be great uh, yeah. showing you around and so on so, so you get a good insight how it's um, how it is here, and um, but but yeah, I think people are very indoctrinated in that sense, uh, and and the only resistance that we have is kosher nationalists from Sweden Democrats that are very loyal to the state of Israel. They're focusing much more on culture, not on ethnicity, you know, and they they want to enforce tougher laws but no repatriation scheme. And it doesn't work like that. If you enforce laws in a hyper-capitalistic society where, you know, let's say multiracialism is the norm, nothing will ever change if you don't start repatriating people that don't belong here. Right, because they'll, they'll have as many kids as, <laughs> as exactly. possible. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And on welfare benefits, because we still have a welfare state that is perfectly designed for the other people's entering now, yeah. So I think I think Sweden will have to go through a very harsh time before people wake up. I do believe the people in Europe will wake up. I just want them to wake up and to identify who is the behind it and not, you know, um, uh, embark on a different path. You know, so wow. yeah. But I, I think you know, um, it's. It it was a blast having you on. We reached an end to the show, and I always ask every one of my guests, and you are a special guest of mine, is there anything more you would like to add to this? I know we talked about different subjects and so on, but I always want my guests to have the last word before we wrap this up. Go ahead, my friend. Uh, I think we, um, we cover these topics uh, adequately. Like um, th this Kanye situation is a double-edged sword, and um, we just have to hope that it's more positive uh, outcome than negative. And um, the the Andrew Tate situation, it's it's um, 
Yeah, it, Islam is not the solution. I just want to warn everybody about that. Like, just say no to Islam. Um, do, 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 do not Islam, do not Judaism, and uh, do not Christianity. I mean, there's um, other um, avenues that can be taken for spiritual growth. Like, uh, I myself I have adopted uh, deism. There was a Greek philosopher by the name of Plotinus who, when you mm. look at um, his view of God, it really lines up with uh, my feelings about, um, you know, the creator. So there's that. Do not Islam. Do not Judaism. Do not. None of those religions are the solution. Um, and um, besides that, you just giving me a brilliant idea since Sweden's so generous with immigrants. Maybe when I do visit, I'll overstay my uh, my yeah. visa and uh, maybe I'll get some good welfare benefits. <laughs> yes, yeah, I think that would be great. I can check out and help you out. I think it would be excellent to have you here in Sweden. Oh, but, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think, and, yeah. And, and, and don't worry, I'll, I'll learn the language, I'll celebrate the culture, and I won't, I won't make a jerk out of myself like uh, some of the uh, Africans and Asians. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, but uh, yeah, I think it was good having you on. I think you you addressed certain points very well. I, I it was really, and I really enjoy having um, these shows with you. And I think you pinpointed quite well with Islam. And I think it's very important because you know this guy, whether we like it or not, um, within certain circles. People don't even know who Andrew Tate is, but the younger lads, all of them know who he is, and he is a, an influencer in that sense. So now when he converted to Islam and devotes his life to become a true Muslim man, I think this will have an effect on many, you know, ruthless, yeah. confused, incel men. They think, oh, Islam will sol solve everything for me, and this is, nothing could be further from the truth. Yeah, so, Oh, at, at best, at best, you're gonna get um an uh, an ugly um, uh five or, or or sub five Muslim woman given to you, or you're gonna be encouraged to marry a sub five Muslim woman, and they may be loyal, but it's not a solution because they're gonna make your life miserable. When you marry a sub five Muslim woman, she's gonna be resentful of the better looking women. And it, it'll be a headache, trust me. I know from fir firsthand experience, like um, they, they're they envious uh, of the women that they, they can't compete with. And it's not really, it's not a solution. Put it, put it, yeah, please. It's, a, it's, a, yeah, don't, it's another don't do it, emotional, guys. It's you don't do it. Guys. It's another emotional dilemma, what you said. If When you pass through a different stage and you, you get an ordinary or below of average Muslim woman and so on, or below average and so on, and then other problems will arise in in that context, like right. brilliantly, like you said. So I think it's I think it's great that we will we were able to talk about this, and also we will follow these events, what will happen between Russia and Ukraine, and I I'm I really want to do another show with you quite soon again. Well, anyways, if, if you like this show, do not forget do not forget to hit that like button. Make sure to subscribe. And please give us a comment. Let me know what you think about the video. Let me know what you think about what we said about Islam, about Andrew Tate, about Kanye West, about what will happen in world affairs in the long run. Well, anyways, uh, thank you so much, uh, Lamar, and let's do this again, okay? All right, thank you.